today on the Run to the Top podcast. There's a million reasons, especially when we're talking about marathons, there's a million reasons why a marathon can go poorly, why any race can go poorly. It doesn't always mean that you're just in horrible shape or that you trained incorrectly or that you need to absolutely massively overhaul your entire training plan. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast from Runners Connect, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. Together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now here's your host, Sinead Hockey. Hey guys, this is Sinead back with you again for this latest episode of Run to the Top brought to you by Runners Connect. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I hope you're having a wonderful day and that this podcast makes it even better. This week, we have a pretty special guest on the show, but before I introduce him, I just want to fill you in on last week's interview, just in case you missed it. I sat down with ultra runner and founder of the blog Social Shark, Nathan Maxwell. Like a lot of runners, Nathan started running to get in shape. He did a few 5Ks and then decided to try his hand at the half marathon. That was in 2012. Since then, Nathan has completed 44 ultra marathons, 9 marathons, and 3 100 milers. And he loves sharing his adventures and ultra running advice on his blog, Social Shark. Nathan shared with us a little bit about his journey, how you can transition from the marathon to ultras if you are interested, and how to keep running exciting. It was a really fascinating interview, so be sure to check it out if you're interested. On to this week's interview. This is the first episode I didn't have to do any homework for because today's guest just so happens to be my boyfriend, Michael Hammond. For our Runners Connect members listening, you know Michael as our director of coaching, but for everyone else, you might remember Michael's Run to the Top interview about a year ago when Tina Muir was hosting the podcast. In case you're not familiar with Michael, he's a graduate of Virginia Tech, where he ran both cross-country and track and earned two ACC titles and four NCAA All-American honors. After college, he went on to run professionally for a club called Furman Elite, which is where he and I met while I was running for Furman University. Unlike me, Michael's specialties were more in the mid-distances, and his PRs include 149 for the 800, 3.37 3.37 for the 1,500, and 3.57 for the mile. You know, not too shabby. <laughs> Between his years, both the running and coaching, Michael has a wealth of insight that has not only helped our Runners Connect members, but it's helped me keep things in perspective, stay grounded, and get through setbacks, bad races, and self-doubt. Today, he'll explain why... We should never allow running to define us and share his tips for keeping things in perspective, conquering self-doubt, and overcoming the pitfalls of comparison. I'm so excited to jump into this, so after a quick break to thank our wonderful sponsor, Health IQ, we'll be right back with our interview. Did you know you can save on life insurance just for being a runner? Health IQ is an insurance company that works to reward health-conscious people like you with lower insurance rates. Learn more and get a free quote at healthiq.com forward slash runners connect. Hi, Michael. Hey, Sinead. Welcome to Run to the Top slash our very messy closet. Thank you. Glad to be here. (laughs) So I have already bragged about all your running achievements in the intro, so we'll skip over that part and we'll just jump into your job at Runners Connect. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do at Runners Connect? Sure. So my official title since I joined uh, has been I'm the director of coaching. So basically, more or less, uh, Jeff, our, our owner and CEO, had a lot on his plate and kind of felt he was a little overworked, decided to bring someone on to at first, just kind of uh, kind of remove some of the things that he was doing and just give him a little bit of a break and also give him opportunities to, to look at some bigger picture stuff. So that's kind of how I got started is just sort of managing the coaching team, setting schedules, uh, doing a bit of coaching like the, the stream coaching and, and community coaching on my own end. Uh, but it's kind of evolved into a lot of other things to the point where if we were to come up with a title, I don't think we could properly 
really come up with one at this point. I think it's it's very broad. I think I'm basically the way I consider it. I'm second in command to Jeff, um, and and we kind of just take care of everything. So really, there's no specific exact thing I knew do nowadays. Every day can really bring something different. That's great. Actually, a lot of people ask me what it's like working with you, but I feel like our jobs don't really overlap. It's maybe besides when I get to uh, crack the whip and make you do extra kick daily podcasts, but. Outside of that, we don't we don't really work a whole lot together, but um, it's always cool to hear what you're up to. So between your years of running and coaching, obviously at you, you're very experienced uh, when it comes to things runners do correctly and the things runners do incorrectly. So first off, I do want to ask you, what what are some of the biggest mistakes you see runners do when it comes to achieving kind of longevity in the sport and, and mental um, mental health in the sport? That's a great question. What I would say is I, I think what we see the most, and actually we see this a lot with Runners Connect, and I've really just seen it in years before. So I used to work in college. I worked at like a running shoe store, I worked there a couple of years after as well, and, and really got to know a lot about runners and, and kind of what problems they face. I, I think a huge one is definitely putting a, a, a huge amount of pressure on yourself. And, and this is something that almost every runner I've ever met is is pretty guilty of, is putting just massive amounts of pressure on themselves for a race that ultimately, when you think about it, doesn't really mean anything to anyone else besides you. Of course, you have your family, your close friends and stuff. Yeah, they're, they're going to pat you on the back. They're going to say, great job, or whatever. But ultimately, like, let's say you have a, a terrible race. You have a horrible race. You run terribly. Is anyone else going to treat you any differently? Probably not, is, is the answer. I think, yeah, we all want to be able to post on social media how well we did and we're really excited to when we have a great performance, of course, but really everything comes from within when it comes down to it. So I think there's kind of two elements to that. There's one is seeking external approval, I think is a huge one. Uh, I, I think you should really be running for your own reasons and, and for yourself. Uh, and then two is just putting huge amounts of pressure, whether that's from external, like what are my friends going to think? What's my family going to think? What's my Facebook feed going to think? Uh, or whether it's internal in terms of if I don't run well here, I'm a failure. If I run poorly in this workout, I'm a failure. If if I don't hit my mileage goal this week, I'm a failure. And, and I think that actually, I'm going to add a third one here. That kind of leads me into another one, which is thinking of things in black and white. So it's either something is awesome, like you do incredible, you have a great race, or it's absolutely terrible. So if, if you enter a marathon, you have a goal of sub four, sub four hours, and you run four hours and one minute. That's tremendous. You know, that's a tremendous time. If your previous PR was 420 or 415, that's a tremendous time. But far too often we see runners, like they'll make a post on Runners Connect or they'll email us or whatever it is. And they'll say, you know, I I totally failed at my goal. And my goal was four hours. I ran 401. You know, this, I don't know what went wrong. Uh, I'm, I'm really depressed. I'm really upset about it. And that's kind of disappointing to hear because 4 one is still a tremendous result when your PR was was much slower beforehand. Uh, so I think those are kind of the three things that I would say too many runners go through in terms of like a mental training standpoint. A mental standpoint is that they 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 put too much pressure on themselves. They think too much about pressure from friends and family that probably doesn't exist. And then they think of things in terms of black and white terms like good or bad, great or awful. Absolutely. And something you said there, Michael, that really hits home for me is reminding yourself why you run. It should never be for somebody else's approval. It should be for your own happiness and your own uh, sense of fulfillment. So that's a really great point that you made there. And Michael, something else that I thought was interesting about what you just said was you you said that you should never put too much stock in any individual race or workout and I know I've certainly been guilty of that myself. Michael, you've had to talk me off a few ledges in the past after bad races. But can you kind of talk about that a little bit, Michael? How can putting too much emphasis on one performance be counterproductive both before the race and then after maybe, say, a bad race? Sure. So what I would say is I think, first off, as I said before, we see this all the time. We see runners who run a race and it doesn't go very well and and they're just so incredibly upset about it. And I'm not saying that there's anything really wrong with that. I think when you work hard for something and you train for a long time, of course you're going to have 
yeah, of course you're going to be upset. Of course you're going to be disappointed. Of course. But at the same time, in, in terms of how it negatively affects you moving forward, uh, basically how it negatively affects you is if you have this bad race and, and you just let it totally bring you down. You know, we, I've seen people who they will, there's two different ways that this can happen. One is I've seen people who will have a bad race and then you won't hear from them for a month. So let's say like, let's say I'm your personal coach and we, we usually communicate like daily or every other day. And all of a sudden after a bad race, I don't hear from you for a month. You know, I don't even know what you're doing. Uh, maybe you're not running at all. Maybe you totally went on a binge, whether it's food or, 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 uh, or just laziness, kind of couch potato, whatever it is. That, that's one option we see. I'd say actually, though, the, the more common one that I observe is people who have a poor race and immediately take it to mean that they need to work way harder. So they'll have a bad race and then immediately they'll be like, all right, we got to get back. We got to get back to the drawing board. We got to implement some harder long runs. We got to up the paces, up the intensity. And neither of those options are good because you're you're totally... I would say it's kind of like a, a massive like exaggeration uh, or overreaction in terms of your race because really it's just one day. That's one day of 365 in a year, you know, roughly 30 in a month that you had this bad race on. That's it. That's the only time. It could have been – there's a million reasons, especially when we're talking about marathons. There's a million reasons why a marathon can go poorly, why a, any race can go poorly. It doesn't always mean that you're just in horrible shape or that you trained incorrectly, or that you need to absolutely massively overhaul your entire training plan. I think a better response would be to look at it. Uh, and I actually got advice uh, from a, when I was in, first entering college, I was a freshman. I got some advice from from a, an older runner on the team who was very successful. And she actually said, uh, she said that after a race, whether it's good or bad, you need to take a very short amount of time. She meant like, like a day. And you kind of analyze it, analyze it from a very analytical perspective, a very logical perspective, not an emotional perspective. So maybe, maybe you need to like wait 24 hours after the race and then do this because that's when you're kind of raw about it, whether it's good or bad. Uh, but you basically take it, you look at it analytically and you say, what did I do right? And what did I do wrong? And I think there's an important part there is what did I do right? You need to think about what you did right as well, because in all likelihood, you didn't do everything wrong. Even if you had a terrible day, a bad race, there's probably some things that you did well. There's probably the fact that you finished. If you finished the race, that's doing something well, especially if it's a longer race and especially if it was going poorly. So I think looking at the things you did right, looking at the things you did wrong. I mean, from an analytical perspective, not not like I'm such a stupid idiot. I'm I'm a moron. I'm I'm so bad. I'm I'm not talented. I I should quit. That's that's just negative talk, negative self talk. That's not going to get you anywhere. And that's kind of what I was getting at before with with just responding, kind of overreacting but more from an analytical perspective. Okay, maybe maybe you didn't take enough fuel in the first uh, you know 10k, the first 10 miles or so. Maybe you didn't take enough fuel in later. Maybe you weren't able to take in the fuel because your your stomach was bothering you. Maybe you changed something up on race day. Uh, maybe you didn't eat normally in the week beforehand. Those are the kind of things that you need to look at. And then after that, after you have that kind of that thinking period, and then you can go into kind of a, uh, you know, okay, how do I change this moving forward? After that, that should be the end of it. That should be the, because now you've taken the meat from it. You've taken what you need from the race. You've taken the lessons learned and now you move forward. Now you got to get back to that, that stable, uh, kind of mental zone to where you're not super happy with you had a great race. Uh, yeah, you can still be happy, but you're not like on cloud nine, which can often lead to, Again, either overtraining or totally going the opposite way and taking like way too long of a break, or whether you're really upset and disappointed and you just had a bad race, you kind of need to get back to that stable level in order to kind of get back into training. That is something I've actually always admired about you, Michael, is you are so good at taking things in stride, whether they be bad or good races, and just staying level-headed and staying on course toward your goals. It's so important and it's something that you've helped me tremendously with. So I'm glad we talked about that. But Michael, something you touched on there that I really thought was interesting was just remaining positive. This is so hard to do, especially after bad races to really take away what we need to take away from a race and leave behind all the bad stuff. Usually the bad stuff overshadows the good stuff. So 
Michael, can you tell us a little bit about how we can really achieve this? This is a hard thing to do, but how can we really achieve a positive mindset? So I think this this actually gets into, I think, kind of a broader territory than than just running itself. And I think this is a huge part of staying positive is kind of looking at things from a, from a macro perspective, a bigger perspective than just running. I, I think let's say running is just a huge part of your life. It's everything. Like you, you're always thinking about the next race. You're always thinking about the next workout. You're always so focused on that. And that's it. Like that's really the number one thing in your life and everything else is really far down. Obviously this probably isn't the case for, hopefully isn't the case for most people because everybody has, you know, families and jobs and uh, social lives and stuff like that. But if it's really, really high on your priority scale and you have a bad race, then that's going to be that's going to be tough for you because a huge part of your life especially when we're talking about the marathon i know i keep referring to that but when you're talking about the marathon that's maybe max of like 2 or 3 a year so if you're running shorter races 5k's 10k's you can just jump in another one next weekend if you want to but with the marathon there's this huge build up and it's a it is a huge part of your life i understand that but i think a huge part of staying positive is is putting things in perspective from a life standpoint, not necessarily just a running standpoint. Obviously, there's the running part of it, which is what I kind of touched on uh, with the previous question about putting thinking of things from a logical standpoint, a rational standpoint, rather than an emotional one. Uh, that's a big one. And then I think another thing from a running standpoint is kind of always knowing that there's more ahead. You know, yeah, if you're if you you just ran a marathon, yeah, sure, the next one might be several months away, it might be three to five months away. But it is there. It is around the corner. And we all know how quickly, I mean, we're, we're nearing the end of a, a calendar year right now. We kind of all know how quickly months and, and several months can go by. So it is right around the corner. But from a broader perspective, I really do think it's very much about keeping things on an even keel and having having your other priorities kind of take hold for a while. So after a marathon, you've been training really hard. You've been committing several hours a day uh, or at least like four or five days a week to to this marathon, to the training. Now is a great time. I think it's a great time after a marathon or after a big race to kind of like step away from running for a while, to step away. You know, we, we usually give at Runners Connect, we usually give like a three or four week recovery plan anyway, most of which is just not running and maybe a little bit of jogging or whatever. But I think it's a great time to kind of close the training log. You know, if it's on your computer, don't even open it up for a little while. Go, go hang out with friends, go do stuff, go mountain biking, go, go for a long hike, go do stuff that, that you don't really do maybe, or maybe you don't do during marathon training because it'll interfere, uh, with your own running. That's something that I used to do. I, I used to, I forbade myself from, from, uh, mountain biking, from long hikes, from playing tennis. It's a big one. I love playing tennis, basketball, just all these sorts of other things that I wasn't really letting myself do while I was training after a big race, whether it's good or bad is a great time to kind of get back to that stuff because that'll help you put things in perspective. It'll help you keep a more positive mindset because you're having fun. You're hanging out with friends. You're doing things that you enjoy. And ultimately if a month or two goes by, whatever, whatever, whenever you do decide to get back into running and get back into training, and kind of get back into that mindset, you'll be a lot more fresh and you'll be entering it from a very positive standpoint rather than just spending that month or two, uh, you know, being negative, kind of beating yourself up about the race. And then you're just going to go into training, beaten down, unhappy, and not really fresh and ready to tackle the next training cycle. That's a great point. And I think something we runners tend to, uh, we're ten- we tend to be guilty of this is just really defining ourselves as runners rather than as humans who run. So that's a great point, Michael. Something that I always thought was very um, refreshing about you is that you do have other outlets and other passions. And that is so important to have as a runner because sometimes running is not always uh, not always so friendly. So Michael, can you tell us a little bit about your other outlets and how you kind of remained focused and driven on running while also retaining these other passions. Can you tell us a little bit about how you struck that balance? Yeah, so one thing to note is that I started running fairly late. I mean, I started in in high school, but I actually, when I was first started running, I was actually still playing basketball, like in the winter. So that was, it's more or less like the kind of the way I entered running 
was kind of what we're talking about here, where it was not like the ultimate priority. Now that obviously changed, especially, you know, in college, ran for a division one team. Um, and then obviously for a couple, two or three years after college where I was competing on the pro level. Yeah, obviously it definitely changed to where running was, was a huge priority, but I would say I did try really hard to, to keep it on that even keel, to keep it to where I had other things. Um, uh, for instance, like, let's say, you know, I, I actually worked jobs the whole time I was running both in college. And then for when I was competing on the pro level, I actually had, had jobs, you know, to, to support myself during that time. So that kind of provided me a natural way to, to have something else to focus on. I, I always tried to maintain good relationships with friends and family and stuff. I've seen runners who, uh, uh professional runners and stuff who, who do kind of let their relationships suffer. And I understand that to some degree, there's a lot of travel. There's a lot of kind of being kind of in isolation and, and not really having a lot of time for a lot of stuff, but I definitely made a huge effort to, to keep, keep up a social life, keep up with my friends, do, do fun stuff. I mean, I mentioned earlier the hiking thing. Eventually I just gave up on forbidding that I would just, most Sundays I would be out either hiking or basically hiking. I'd play, uh, uh, disc golf, like Frisbee golf. I would play that a lot, which is basically was a way to hike while also throwing a disc around. So stuff like that, that yeah, maybe it negatively impacted my running. Maybe, maybe I didn't recover from that previous week's workouts or the yesterday's long run quite as well as I would have otherwise. But for me, it was so much more important from a mental standpoint to, to have some fun, to, to do some things with my friends, to focus on work, uh, to do other things that took my mind off of running because eventually for me, when I just kept thinking about running, I just, I, I was, I was stressed. I was anxious. I couldn't stop thinking about the next race, which makes my heart go absolutely crazy. Uh, a great example of that is, is going to sleep at night. I used to have a ton of trouble sleeping because I would, I would be thinking about the next race. I would literally, I would either be thinking about the race that just happened. Uh, and then eventually I'd think about the next one and my heart rate would just go crazy and I couldn't fall asleep. So I actually, one interesting example of this is that, um, the night after a race, you know, when you're on the uh, college or pro circuit, your coaches want you, they want you getting a good dinner and then going right to bed, you know, by 10 or 11 PM. For me, I was never able to do that because I, I would go lay in bed till like two or three in the morning and, and just be frustrated. And, and, uh, I just couldn't stop thinking about the race, whether it was good or bad. So actually, to be honest, I started just, I started just going out with friends. I would, go, go to the, go to the bars or go hang out at a friend's house or, or do something, even if it involved, even if it involved a little alcohol or staying up really late or whatever, whatever it was for me, that was actually more beneficial because I was able to turn my brain off for a little bit and, and really relax, let the race get out of my head. And then the next day, yeah, I didn't get a ton of sleep. Yeah. Maybe I drank a little too much the night before, whatever it was, Either way, I was actually fresher the next day from a mental standpoint and ultimately in the weeks, months that followed, fresher from a physical standpoint as well because I allowed myself to relax and, and stay positive about things and, and really put the running and the racing in perspective. After the break, Michael will share his advice on coping with injury, explain why he feels it's important to never put all your eggs in the running basket and give us some tips as to how we can avoid falling into the comparison trap. This is Sinead Hockey, and you're listening to Run to the Top at Runners Connect. Have you ever wondered why we get penalized by life insurance companies for family history, BMI, and other attributes, but we don't get rewarded for, you know, running and being active? If you can save money for being a good driver, it only makes sense that you should be able to save money for living a healthy lifestyle. And Health IQ agrees. Health IQ is an insurance company that uses science and data to secure lower rates on life insurance for health-conscious people like you and me. And that's pretty amazing given science shows risk of heart disease is 49% less and risk of all-cause mortality is 30% less for runners than it is for the average Joe. Not such a bad bonus for logging some miles. 
And what I really love about Health IQ is that you can actually submit your running logs to get lower rates. All you have to do is take a running IQ quiz and plug in your data from Strava, RunKeeper, Garmin, and even your latest race results to save as much as almost 26% on your life insurance. Learn more and get a free quote at healthiq.com forward slash runners connect. Again, that's healthiq.com forward slash runners connect. Thank you so much to Health IQ for sponsoring Run to the Top and for rewarding runners for doing what they love. We're back with Michael and Michael, earlier you talked about the importance of not allowing running to consume us and not letting running be your sole purpose in life. So going off of that, Michael, we haven't really talked about injuries yet. And injuries in running can be pretty life altering. They can be they can kind of turn your world upside down when running is so important to you and you suddenly can't do it anymore. So, Michael, I know for you, unfortunately, you're no stranger to injury. You dealt with a number of very serious injuries, especially in the last few years of your career. So can you speak to that a little bit, Michael? How did you cope with injuries and take your mind off running when you weren't able to go for a run? So I'm really glad you brought this up because injury is something I, I was kind of meaning to talk about anyway, because I think injuries are kind of the the litmus test here. So when you get injured from running and you can't run at all, let's, let's say it's a pretty serious injury and you need to take like, uh, let's say like six to eight weeks completely off, like a stress fracture type injury. I think that's a great point where you have to really sit back and say, hey, what are my priorities in life? Because it's funny, I've, I've seen professional runners, and even when I was competing on the professional level, and I, I actually have one example in particular. I had a friend who w- I was training with, and he got he got mono. So not an injury, but he got an illness. And I remember, I remember him coming home uh, after he had gotten the official diagnosis, and he was supposed to sit out for, I think, I think it was like four, four or five weeks completely, like no running, no hard exercise at all. And he just sat on the couch. He was a cool guy. And, and he, he definitely had a, a, a good perspective on things, but even he sat down and just kind of looked at me and said, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I really don't know what I'm going to do running right now. Running is everything. What, what am I literally going to do with my time? Uh, so that's definitely an issue that, that, uh, professionals face, but for, for our listeners, you know, for, for people listening to this podcast right now, I think injuries will definitely show you what your priorities are. If, if you get injured and next thing you know, you're spending every day just, just worrying and anxious about, about the, the training you're missing. That's obviously, I think that to me, that would be a good kind of red flag. I don't want to be, I don't want to sound like, like you can't have pr- your running be your priority at all. I don't want to sound like you, you need to totally back away and, and take years off of running and put it in a better perspective. What I'm saying is I think that's somewhat of a red flag and, and more of a push for you to go do some other stuff. Injuries will definitely, will definitely test your patience. That's for sure. And I think, I just think it's a great opportunity to, to kind of focus on some other stuff, to kind of pull back from running and look at it from a fresh perspective. Uh, when I first started getting injured, I, I had run for several years without really without a single injury. So when I first started getting injured, it was, it was kind of a foreign thing to me. I got like a, a plantar fasciitis injury. I kind of went through like the, the main primary injuries like plantar fasciitis, Achilles, IT band, uh, patella femoral, like the knee, runner's knee. I kind of went through all the main ones. And when I got the knee one, that was a big one because I actually had to take a, an extended amount of time completely off of running. That was new to me. When I had the Achilles and plantar, I missed like a, a, like a week or two here and there, but not really like months on end. I think that was a huge point for me where I remember, I think for like two or three weeks into the knee injury, I was just like, okay, I gotta, gotta get in the pool. I gotta get my cross training in, which, which by the way, when you have a knee injury, the only thing you can do basically is swim with a pull buoy, which is, I hate swimming already. And so when you put a pull buoy on, you can't even use your legs. It was just miserable. I remember I was going to this, this like dark kind of like dungy pool that at this YM, this local YMCA that was, it was real dark and, and no one was ever in there. And it was just absolutely a miserable experience. And I remember just kind of at one point, I'm just kind of sitting there thinking about, you know, classic thinking about the injury, thinking about running, thinking about the training I'm missing. And I kind of realized 
that nothing I was doing in terms of like the, the mental stress, nothing I was doing was actually helping anything. If anything, it was probably making it worse because I wasn't sleeping well. I probably wasn't eating right just because I was, I was so stressed about it and, and not just not in a good place overall. And I think that was a good kind of like light bulb moment, moment for me where I just said, you know what? I just need to relax. I, just, I really just need to relax, rest, let it, let it happen. Get, yeah. get some cross training in when I can, but really just kind of rest, relax and, and put things in perspective, go have some fun. I think that was right around uh, Christmas time or new year's went and had a great Christmas and new year's because why should I let this injury get in the way of, of Christmas with my family and a fun new year's Eve? You know, why should I get, let this get in the way? That doesn't make any sense. So I think for, for our listeners to think about is I really think an injury should be looked at from, you should do everything you can to look at an injury from a positive perspective. One thing I've, I've done with a lot of our members is, Hey, you got an injury. It's, it's like, okay, you got to take four to six weeks off or whatever time it is. That's unfortunate. That definitely is unfortunate, but Hey, what, a, what, a, what a great opportunity to work on some other stuff. Like, let's say, let's say you're, you're somebody who has kind of chronic, like it band hip problems. Okay. When you're running now that you have to take this amount of time off, let's say it's for something else, some other type of injury. This is a great opportunity to get some strength training in. To, to, to maybe like four, you can go every other day. Now you don't, you're not going to interfere with your running. You can really get some solid strength training in and strengthen your hips, strengthen your glutes, strengthen your entire core. And that's a great opportunity. So I think it's, it really does come down to kind of like a glass half full type thing. And in terms of you get injured, you need to look at it from a positive perspective. Maybe, maybe your body truly just needed rest. It needs real, real rest from running. Maybe you've been, you've been beating it down too much and you haven't been giving it the appropriate recovery, which is so common. We see that all the time. And now that you're injured, you have to, you literally have to take time off. So anything you can do to think of it from a positive uh, frame of mind is going to be huge moving forward. And then, then it'll be the kind of the same thing I was talking about before. When you come back from a break, like after a race, when you come back from the injury, you're going to be way more fresh from a mental standpoint, from a physical standpoint and, and ready to tackle the training ahead and, and hopefully stronger, uh, both mentally and physically moving forward. I, I really love that mentality of extracting the good out of a bad situation and really using it to your advantage, using it as a time, like Michael said, to either work on strengthening other areas of your body or even using it as a time to focus on other passions in your life. So really great point there and something that I think is so important to longevity in the sport and and really just retaining the enjoyment of running. So great point there, Michael. And uh, something I, I was interested in asking you as well is, um, you know, a lot of our anxiety as runners does come from comparison. And I know a lot of our anxiety as humans comes from comparison. Comparison is the thief of joy, as Theodore Roosevelt said. So, Michael, why do you feel this is especially true among runners? And why do you feel like we should really work to avoid comparing ourselves to other runners? Yeah, for sure. I, I think I think it's just natural. It's probably just a total like aspect of human nature when it comes down to it is we, we naturally compare ourselves to our peers, to our friends, to our family. I mean, we compare ourselves to everybody. That, that's a natural thing. I think where you get in trouble with it in running, I, I'm, I'm going to, I've been doing this kind of throughout this interview where I've been talking about things from like my perspective first and then trying to broaden it out and relate it. So from my perspective, I think one thing that held me back, I would say in my own running career was that comparison. I was always, because to me, at least when I was competing, I wanted to win. You know, I, I won't lie to you. I was, I was extremely competitive. Um, I've always been extremely competitive. And when I was training, it was training so I could win races. I wasn't just, I'll be perfectly honest. I was not training so that I could do my best, you know, which, which seems counterintuitive, but I was not training to where I could just run a PR. I wanted to win. I wanted to enter a race. I wanted to win it in college. I wanted to win a national title in the pro circuit. I wanted to make an Olympic team. So I think for me, the problem there that where that kind of led me into a hole was that, okay, let's say you're a pro and you want to make the Olympic team. Naturally, you're going to compare yourself to the, to the top three guys, right? The, the three guys that are making the Olympic team, you're going to compare yourself directly to them, but they're different people. They're entirely different people. They're doing different training. They're coming from different backgrounds. Everything is so radically different that you shouldn't, you shouldn't compare yourself to them because that's what, what most often what it's going to do and what it did for me. Like, let's say, uh, Matt Centrowitz, the 
gold medalist, American in the 1500 meters in 2016. He, let's say he releases like a sample of like some of the workouts he did going into the Olympics that year. What am I going to do in all likelihood? I'm going to look at that, take it to my coach and be like, Hey, we got to do these workouts. We got to do this exact workout because this is what Centro did to run super fast and win, win gold. This is what we got to do. So you, taking this kind of to a broader level, I, I do think one thing I have to mention is I think it's usually best for runners, like most of our listeners, most, I mean, 99.9% of runners to completely ignore professionals more or less. So I, I know that's going to sound weird and it might even offend some people, but in the end, these are, these are professionals. These are people who, who do this literally for a living. Not only do they do it for a living, they were talented enough, enough in high school to be recruited by the best colleges in, in the country. Okay. They were talented enough in college to win national titles, NCAA titles over their peers. They were talented enough in, in, in college of those NCAA champions to get huge professional contracts. And they're talented enough amongst that pool to win Olympic medals, world medals, uh, win major marathons, stuff like that. So these are, that's one aspect of it is these are, if you want to say freaks amongst freaks, amongst freaks, even, I mean, these are truly the absolute best of the best, most talented people in the world. That's number one. Hopefully that kind of shows you why you should ever take everything they say with a grain of salt. And the second thing is just the fact that because they are professionals, so much of their life is, is dedicated to running. Everything in their life is not so much. Everything, literally everything in their life is dedicated to running. So any advice that they give, like let's say they give like mindset tips. I mean, hey, th that's great. Sure, I I'm sure there's some, some value in that. But at the same time, does somebody who's training to win an Olympic medal – relate really that well to someone who's training to run a sub four hour marathon? I, I would think probably not. Uh, in all likelihood, those are, those are completely different people. In my opinion, you should look at professionals as if they're playing a totally different sport. It, it's so different what they're doing. And, and I think, um, I, I really do think that that's a big part of it is being able to put that in perspective and say, Hey, look, I'm not training to win a medal. I'm not training to to beat all these other people. Ultimately, what are you training for? You're training to do well on your your own end. I mean, I think that's something that I missed. I kind of whiffed on in my own career was that the most special moments, yeah, sure, winning races was great. Yeah, sure, beating certain people I had rivalries with was great. But I remember some of the most proud feelings that I ever had were when I was by myself, completely alone after a, a great race, and I, and I just felt that tremendous sense of pride and accomplishment. And, and that is really what, in my opinion, you should be training for. I know there's other aspects. There's health. There's, there's you know, life, longevity. There's stuff like that, of course. But really, it's all for a, a, a sense of satisfaction within yourself. And I really do think that that's why we get in trouble with, uh, with comparing ourselves to other runners, to, to professionals, to to our friends, even to other people on our social media feed, whatever it may be. I really do think that ultimately it doesn't help and it probably just hinders your progress and really also hinders just your enjoyment of the sport and enjoyment in your own personal accomplishments. That's a really great point. And Michael and I have discussed this extensively. We've talked about the pitfalls of comparison, especially, um, you know, when you're scrolling through your Instagram or Facebook and you, you see all these runners, these elite runners that you, you do find it hard to remove yourself from the comparison trap. I know, like Michael said, it is important to kind of toss the top 1% of runners when, you, when you're thinking about running because it is a whole other ball game. I, I remember myself actually watching a video of Molly Huddle doing, I think, seven by a mile, and she was doing them all in like 450, and I was just kind of devastated. I was, I was really demoralized and just thinking I'll never be able to achieve that. So why should I even bother? And that's such a, such a backwards mentality to have with running because it is so individual. It is so, you know, you can make it as serious as you want to make it and you can really just focus on achieving what you can achieve. So it's, it's a very individual sport. It's something that you do have to kind of remind yourself of constantly, but it's uh that's the beauty of running, I think, is you can really just focus on yourself. So great point there, Michael. And last but not least, I, I do want to just to wrap it up. 
maybe talk a little bit about some other tips that you have for runners um, when it comes to keeping things in perspective and really just achieving longevity in the sport. I know, you know, a lot of runners tend to burn out mentally and um, that's, that can be easy to avoid, I think. So Michael, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. That's a great point. What you said about um, looking at Molly Huddle's workout. I think I've definitely had similar experiences where you see some just insane workout by somebody. And, and I think that's even more relevant to our listeners because you look at somebody's workout or you look at somebody's uh, performance or, or their, their last couple miles or their long run, whatever it is that you're looking at. And it's just so drastically different. That's why I really did want to get that point across of the top 1% just kind of just saying, Hey, they're not relevant to me. They're playing a different sport. They may as well be, you know, NBA basketball players for all that matters because they're, they're just totally different and sure they can offer advice, but you always have to take it with a grain of salt to, by remembering that one, they're being paid big amounts of money to do what they do Two, uh, kind of going on that again. They, they have nothing else going on. That's literally their job. That's their life. Uh, and then three, I think is kind of another thing I won't touch on too much, but basically you never really know exact, you never get the full picture of exactly what somebody is doing. Um, I know I'm kind of like treading the subject lightly, but you know, if any, any baseball fans out there, you know, everybody thought Mark McGuire was hitting, you know, what, 600 home runs just because he was, you know, he working hard in the gym. You know what I mean? So I I think it's one of those things where you can't ever really, really know what's going on, especially with a professional. Um, but really anybody, anybody to that degree, anybody you see posting, Here's a great example for our members because I hear a lot of our members talk about uh, how they see, you know, a lot of their Facebook friends will post workouts and stuff. And let's say they post some workout and, and you're, you're like, man, this is, uh, this is really crazy. I, how did they do that? I can't do that. How do you know they did it? You know, is there a video? Is there, is there actual evidence? Is it, is it on their Garmin, on their Strava? You don't know. If they just post some random splits, you have no idea. And even if it's on a Garmin, I don't know. What if they what if they took a car and just did the route in that amount of time? I have no idea. You have no idea either. And I think that's where I, I really think you have to keep it to yourself. I do think on that social media aspect, I do think social media is definitely somewhere that I believe can become problematic when we're talking about this, when we're talking about keeping things in perspective and we're talking about focusing on your own improvement over that of other people is that we're constantly bombarded nowadays with, with other people in their lives. If you're on social media, if you're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is, you are every single minute of every single day, you are getting updates. And and I know a lot of runners will follow other runners. They'll follow all these other runners, people similar to them who love posting their workouts. They love posting about this incredible session. They just had this, this insane race that they just ran whatever it is, you're constantly bombarded with that. So I think that's actually kind of a new problem in, in, uh, the current day and age is that even if you want to keep it in perspective, even if you want to keep it relevant to yourself, that's incredibly difficult, uh, when you're constantly bombarded with it. So I I do think that, you know, this is a difficult one because what I want to say is on the social media standpoint, I want to say, Hey, just, just keep it in perspective, take it with a grain of salt, know that they might, they might be lying. They might not have really done what they did. They might just be at a totally different point in their life, in their, uh, in their training. Uh, that's another relevant point is that, you know, in terms of comparison, you can't, if you're, if you're 50 years old, you cannot compare yourself to 25. It's not fair to yourself. Um, one of our runners connect members actually did had a really great post one time about, about, um, I'm trying to remember the exact, I think he called it decade PRs. If I remember correctly, he called it decade PR. So he said, I think he was, if I remember correctly, I think he was like in his forties I think he was like 42, 43. And he said, Hey, set a new decade PR. And I, I thought I knew what it meant, but I wasn't hundred percent sure. So I asked him and he said, well, I ran in my twenties. I ran in my, I've run since, I think he said he'd ran since he was like early twenties. And he said that obviously I ran faster times then naturally than I'm going to now. If you're training seriously in your twenties, you're going to run faster than you will in your forties. That's just human nature. Um, and he said, well, I said a decade PR because uh, this is my PR for in my forties. I really liked that because it, it, that is when we're talking about comparison, I think one thing we haven't touched on is comparing to yourself, you know, and you cannot compare yourself to your twenties, even your thirties. If you're in your fifties or sixties, you're not going to be the same runner that you were in your twenties and thirties. It's just not reality. And anyone you see who's running PRs 
like in their 40s or 50s, that's because they just didn't either didn't run or they didn't train well when they were in their 20s or 30s. That's just bottom line it, that you're you're at your most your physical peak when you're in your 20s kind of extends into the 30s for for longer distance like marathons and halves. But either way, that's, that's I know that's a bit of a sidetrack there, but I think that's really important is to to not let yourself compare too much to your younger self. Don't even compare to last year's self. It's a new year. You know, you're you're a year older, you're a year hopefully wiser and and more well trained, but at the same time, there's other factors as well. So I really do think that uh, going back to the social media thing, I, I just think that if you can take it with a grain of salt, if if you have that ability, which is which is tough, it's difficult, then do that. Otherwise, just take a step away. You know, if you find yourself looking at uh, looking at stuff online, and and you're just saying, man, this is uh, this is really making me feel down. Kind of like Sinead was talking about with uh, with feeling kind of depressed, looking at Molly Huddle's workouts, who's an absolute you know, powerhouse. What, what a woman. She runs so fast. She's incredible. I, I don't even want to relate to her. I, I think if I, even when I was at my best, if I looked at her workouts, I think I would have felt in, extremely intimidated. That would have been a tough workout for me. Uh, so you can't look at that stuff. If, if you find yourself feeling that you need to step away, you need to close the app. You need to maybe delete it for a little while. You need to really, really step away uh, I hate to say block that friend, but, <laughs> but I mean, uh, at some point you got to do what you got to do. You have to keep you have to take care of yourself. Take care of number one and make sure that if you're not able to put put it in the perspective we were talking about before, if you're not able to take it with a grain of salt, which there's no shame. Like I said, you are, you know, these these social media companies are engineering your life to be focused around like your friends and, and connections and all that stuff. So it's not your it's not your fault. But if you can't do that, remove yourself a little bit. Take a step back and and really try to focus on yourself. Maybe log your workouts on, on a piece of paper for a couple of weeks. Don't use Strava. Don't use Garmin and, and just make it all, make your running all about you. Don't even tell anybody about your runs. Don't tell your friends. Don't tell your family, whatever it is, just keep it, make it all about you for a little bit of time. And, and I think from there you'll gain a better perspective. And then hopefully after that, be able to kind of reenter the, the social world a little bit better with a fresher perspective and, and more of a focus on yourself and your own accomplishments. That's so true. And Michael knows probably better than anyone that I have struggled with social media in the past where he knows I've, I've deleted Instagram off my phone several times. And it really is about keeping things in perspective. Like he said, it's so hard to do, but it's also if social media isn't something that lifts you up, if it's not something that makes you happy and inspires you, then you might want to take a look at it and see how it's making you feel. If it's making you feel demoralized or uninspired, then just take a little break from it and see if you can just kind of focus on yourself and, and really just regather that, that, um, sense of self-improvement. So it's social media. It's a beautiful thing. It can really be something very inspiring, but it can also be something that can tear you down a little bit if you're not careful. So it's, it's really important to take everything with a grain of salt, like Michael said, and just keep it in perspective so really great point there. Something that you actually reminded me of, Michael, one of our members at Runners Connect, actually, very recently, he was the um, runner of the week, and he <laughs> didn't tell his family that he was going to race. He didn't tell anybody, any of the coaches at Runners Connect that he was going to race because he just really didn't want any expectations. He just wanted to race because he wanted to race and he wanted to just see what he could do. So he went out there and he... PR'd massively. I think it was a 10K and he PR'd by something like two minutes. And um, yeah, he, he just didn't tell anyone. And, uh, you know, he didn't have any uh, any negative anxiety or expectations going into the race, which I thought was pretty interesting and something that can be a really good idea sometimes. So really interesting story there. But uh, Michael, getting back to you, I know you have taken um, a... <laughs> Some runners would call it a hiatus from running, but I think you, you'd you probably call it retirement at this point, and uh, you're focusing on some other passions. So can you tell us a little bit about that and, and what's on tap for you next? Yeah, by the way, that was awesome. I, I wish we could remember his name, but that, that was super cool when that guy um, ran that PR. He was Athlete of the Week recently, so you can go look that up. Um, in terms of myself, yes, I would say I'm on a super long, perhaps permanent hiatus from running. Um I know I talked about it earlier earlier in this podcast, and I talked about how for me running was was very 
it was a means to an end. It was always a means to an end for me. I always, I trained, I didn't train to train. I didn't run to run. I trained to race. I trained so I'd be ready for the next race. Uh, since this podcast is about, like, it clearly has kind of become about like keeping things in perspective and, and focusing kind of on yourself. It's actually pretty unfortunate. Uh, and I, I'm, I laugh about it now, but it's actually pretty unfortunate when I think about it is that I really think, I think I actually did a really good job of accomplishing this and, and really implementing it in my own life right before I had basically a career ending injury. Um, it, it was, it was roughly like early spring, like late winter, early spring of 2016. And I was, yeah, I, I think I had gotten things in perspective. I was really enjoying life. I was enjoying my training. Uh, and I was, I wasn't too crazy intense. I was obviously training hard and, and doing everything I could to get better, but I actually had things in a really good perspective and, and yeah, I was really excited about things moving forward. And then unfortunately got a very, very serious, um, calf injury and was not able to run for, for quite a while afterward. Uh, it it took me out of the Olympic trials that year and definitely unfortunate. But the, the funny thing is, I really think that because I had kind of moved into that point in my life where I had so many other things going on. I already started working for Jeff with, with Runners Connect, uh, had a few other things going on. And I think ultimately that injury, you know, obviously that, that surpassed the Olympic trials and I wasn't able to run there. And I basically, after that, I think I looked at the calendar. I looked at, you know, my own running. I looked at my career and, and all the races I had run before. And I kind of just said, I, I think that's it. I, I really, it wasn't like I had this huge moment or, or it was like this super sad retirement announcement type thing. I really think for me, it was just kind of like, I think I'm done. I think that's it. I think that the running chapter for me, which was about, about 10 years long, maybe nine years uh, of, of very intense, very focused, uh, goal driven running and racing. And I think at that point it, it just kind of made sense to move on. So actually you, you asked about kind of the things that I'm, that I'm moving into. Well, from a physical standpoint, yes, I, I have not run much for a while. It was it actually really was because of the calf. I was, uh, I mean, I think I went, tried to go on a run maybe like, maybe like four or five months after that injury and it still hurt. So it was like, okay, well, you know, obviously now I'm not, I'm retired. I'm not really training for anything. So I'm just going to take more time off. So that, that kind of led into a very long break from running. But I really think a big part of it is that I, I just don't really love going out for a run. I almost wish I did, uh, but I just don't. It really, it clearly was always a means to an end for me uh, in terms of getting what I wanted out of racing and, and competing. But from a physical standpoint, I actually, I, you know, I've always been, always been really skinny. Uh, you know, even when I was playing other sports like basketball, baseball, I was still always really small and really skinny. And I just kind of decided after I stopped running, I said, Hey, this, this would be, I think it'd be really cool to totally just transform my body, you know, just kind of like do something completely different, uh, and, and totally transform myself. So what I actually did in the probably maybe like 10 months or so after I retired, was I started getting in the gym, I uh, started lifting pretty heavy, started eating a lot, um, and ended up, I was usually around like 140 or maybe a little over when I was, when I was running and I actually ended up working, working up to about 175, which is, which is a pretty huge difference. 175 obviously isn't heavy by any means, but when you were 140 beforehand, that, that's a lot of weight. That's a huge difference. Uh, and I was definitely very, very proud of that. I think the cool thing there was that it did allow me for, for something to, something to focus on, you know, something physical, something athletic to, to focus on. And now I've kind of, I've actually lost a little bit of weight. I kind of changed up my diet. I love trying new things. That's it. Hopefully that's been getting across in this podcast. I love trying new things, totally trying out like a completely different diet, still lifting. Um, but just trying out something different. I've actually lost like, like over 10 pounds. Um, even though I'm still lifting and trying to eat a lot, it's just, just love trying new things. So from a physical standpoint, I think that's what I'll keep doing is just kind of trying different things, trying different diets, different lifting plans, different, uh, levels of aerobic activity and, and just kind of seeing how I respond to it, seeing what I enjoy and, and really just taking this kind of post-retirement time to, to do stuff like that. Cause obviously you can't, you can't do anything super drastic like that when you're competing. Uh, and that's definitely been something that's fun. And then, you know, from a runners connect standpoint, obviously want to throw in something about that. Definitely working with Jeff to make the platform better, uh, make the platform just more enjoyable more fun, more helpful for our members. And, and that's something that I've really enjoyed. And, and, uh, 
I definitely hope to keep doing that moving forward. And for all of our uh, Runners Connect members out there, I know you have seen the fruits of Michael's labor. He, he's very, um, he's made a, a huge impact on the site, I think. And we've we've got quite a few more users, actually, too, since Michael started. I think we've got about a couple hundred who have joined and, and seen great success. So Michael is great at what he does. He's a fantastic coach. And um, his title, which is kind of the head coach of Runners Connect, is very, very fitting. He's great at what he does. So I think that's enough sweet talking. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Really appreciate it. And I think we packed quite a bit into this episode. So Michael, thank you so much. Yeah, Sinead, thanks for having me. Michael has been my rock through a lot of rough patches in running. And I think it's pretty clear why. While he's obviously a big believer in working hard toward your running goals, because let's face it, you don't run a sub four mile by slacking off. He believes life is too short and also just too full of other cool things to let yourself get too bogged down, comparing yourself to others or dwelling on last week's bad race. If you want to keep up with Michael, you can follow him on Instagram at Michael T. Hammond. As you might have seen in the image in our show notes for this episode, our dog Braille is also full of sage advice, so definitely be sure to check out Michael's Instagram for more of that. Before I sign off, next week we'll be speaking with Bob Sibahar, who we had on Run to the Top just a few months ago. In case you missed that episode, Bob is a registered dietitian, exercise physiologist, NSCA certified strength and conditioning specialist, and USA triathlon level three elite coach. He was also a sport dietitian for the 2008 U.S. Olympic team. While Bob's last interview was a huge hit, it was pretty technical and we didn't have enough time to get to everything I wanted to. So I actually opened the floor up to you guys to send in questions you'd like answered the next time around. I got some really great questions from you guys, so I'm looking forward to having Bob on again to answer those. If you're interested, be sure to check it out next week. Thank you so much again for joining me, and I hope you enjoy today's show. Until next time, I hope training's going well, and you have a wonderful week. Thanks for listening to the Run to the Top podcast from runnersconnect.net. 